Of all contemporary directors, Wes Anderson might be the most well-known to have a signature typographic style. His association with Futura is almost a trope. You won't find a Wes Anderson parody on the internet without the bold geometric sans serif appearing throughout. I think this observation, while true, is a bit stuck in his early career. Anderson has actually evolved in his typographic flair throughout his filmography in some ways you wouldn't expect. So I wanted to take a deeper dive into how exactly he uses type and lettering in his films. In this video, we'll look at his early career from Bottle Rocket to Royal Tenenbaums. In the second video, we'll cover his mid-career through the 2000s, and in part three, we'll cover his recent films up to the upcoming French Dispatch. So let's dive in, starting with Wes's debut feature film, we begin, of course, with Futura. The very opening title is Futura Bold, all caps, but let's put a pin in that because there's a lot to unpack about Futura and Anderson's affinity for it. But after this, the type that we see throughout Bottle Rocket is rather incidental in the background, not doing any storytelling in particular. There is a random assortment of typefaces, certainly not the meticulous art direction we'll see in his future work. Perhaps the only time attention is brought to letter forms of any kind is when we get a look into Owen Wilson's character Dignan's notebook, which, fun fact, is actually Owen Wilson's own handwriting. Oh, wow. This first film itself has very little deliberate production design to examine, probably because it was done in a budget, but of some note are the promotional posters. The typography in these posters is very 1996 and also very un-Wes Anderson. The red version gives us this strange layered type effect for the title that looks a bit Nickelodeon, and for the tagline we have the extremely 1990s choice of Matrix by Emigre Fonts, a pioneering digital type foundry that reached peak cultural saturation from the mid-90s to mid-2000s. In the alternative poster, we have an even more jarring typographic choice with Serpentine, which has always had a pulpy action sci-fi vibe. Consider the fact that this poster for a Wes Anderson film uses the same font as the posters for the Pierce Brosnan James Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies, released a year later. The cover for the Criterion Collection version, of course, falls much more in line with what we associate with a Wes Anderson movie, but honestly, much of that signature aesthetic wouldn't find its expression until... In his sophomore film, we see Futura return, but this time in a more starring role. Diegesis, in filmmaking terms, refers to the fictional world the characters inhabit. The term crops up often when talking about sound. Diegetic sound is something the characters are aware of, like a song playing on the radio in shot. Non-diegetic sounds would be music we hear in a montage, but the characters are not aware of. In Rushmore, we get Wes Anderson's first use of non-diegetic typography in Futura Bold, all caps, of course. Notably, it's used in a montage for the protagonist Max's extracurricular activities. But we can see the specific template, the montage with an overlay of Futura in alternating corners of the composition, become a recurring motif in his future projects. Unlike Bottle Rocket, the diegetic type in this film feels much more deliberately chosen to help tell the story. We get the appropriately industrial-feeling, retro-futuristic Eurosteel for the Bloom International logo, the sign for the stuffy private Rushmore Academy itself, set in the cramped, old-school alternate gothic, contrasts with public Grover Cleveland High School's varsity-style lettering. What I want to highlight here is that there are a broad palette of fonts used to showcase the nature of the leading characters and settings. Speaking of which, while the Futura montage might have burned its way into our cultural memory, there is another kind of lettering that gets disproportionate screen time in Rushmore, calligraphy. 
our protagonist, Max, is established to be the Calligraphy Club president. And this is something the art department on this film commit to 100%. We see his elegant, italic hand script used on everything from handwritten signs to the way that his name is written at the top of exam sheets to his revenge notes down to the algebra on the chalkboard in the opening sequence. It's a wonderful detail and a cute bit of storytelling, especially through the juxtaposition between Max's calligraphy and the childish scrawl of his would-be sidekick, Dirk. The calligraphy in the film was done by Mark Van Stone, who, apart from also doing lettering for the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, later became a leading expert in the field of Mayan hieroglyphics. That's the kind of career diversity a man wouldn't mind. And speaking of which, if you wouldn't mind clicking that like button, it really does tell the algorithm good things about me and helps me to grow the audience for this channel, which I greatly appreciate. Looking at the promotional material for Rushmore, for reasons unknown, the marketing department thought the best way to sell an indie coming-of-age comedy was to invoke Soviet propaganda poster design. And then there's this typeface, FF Blur, another trendy choice of the late 90s. A lot of these early digital fonts were distorted or manipulated versions of other fonts, scanned and badly revectorized. There's a reason why we don't see them used much anymore, but they certainly do evoke an era for those of us who were around back then. Rushmore would prove to be Wes Anderson's breakthrough hit, but nobody knew that going into promoting the film. Hereafter, he would get even more meticulous about the details of art direction, down to even the promotional materials. As we reach the next in our list... If Wes Anderson was relatively coy about his affection for Futura in earlier films, with Royal Tenenbaums, Wes's font fanboyism reaches fever pitch. By my count, this film has over a hundred individual shots featuring his favorite sans serif type. So before we dig into the how and why, let's give some context and talk about what exactly Futura is and what makes it such a significant typeface in 20th century graphic design. Futura is a typeface or font family designed in the geometric sans serif style. Sans serif meaning without serifs, the small feet at the ends of strokes in typefaces like Times New Roman or Garamond. Geometric because the letter forms are constructed around pure geometry, straight lines, triangles, squares, and near perfect circles. It was designed by Paul Renner and released in 1927 by the Bauer Type Foundry in Germany. This was contemporaneous with the Bauhaus School of Art and the founding of the modernist art movement. In design, the modernists sought to strip away the ornamentation and subjective styling of the past and pair things back to only what was essential and functional. Renner shared many of those modernist ideals and Futura itself, while not as slavish to pure geometry as, say, Herbert Beyer's Universal, it did cast aside a lot of the quirks of earlier sans serif designs of the Victorian era known as grotesques. Those were developed for advertising and they were somewhat quirky with organic forms born out of their roots in sign writing. Futura and its ilk were a clean break from that and became the bedrock of the new typography movement in German and Swiss graphic design. Futura was one of the most influential fonts of the 20th century, a huge commercial success not only in Europe, but also America. It was used by everyone from NASA to Nike to Richard Nixon. If I'm still doing YouTube in 2027 for its 100th birthday, I'll do a deep dive on the history of Futura, which could easily fill an hour on its own. In the meantime, if you want to know more about this fascinating history, I highly recommend the book Never Use Futura by Douglas Thomas. But why does Wes Anderson fixate on Futura specifically? Let's break down exactly how he uses it. In Roman or bold, almost always in all caps, often widely tracked. This isn't how, say, Barbara Kruger used Futura in bold italic on a red backplate, or how Nike or Volkswagen or Supreme use it, which is literally just how Barbara Kruger used it, but again, stolen and capitalism is ironic now. Wes Anderson isn't nodding at any of those cultural references. In Royal Tenenbaums, we see it used everywhere, both appropriately 
and not. Futura works for a book cover, but it's a terrible choice for screen graphics for a sporting event. The legibility is terrible and tone is far too stiff and not appropriate. But Anderson isn't trying to accurately recreate how Futura was used in the past. It's a deliberate, exaggerated style that suggests towards a vague nostalgia for a non-specific time in the pre-digital 20th century. His Futura nods towards Stanley Kubrick's Futura, NASA's Futura, the Futura of museum plaques and library cards. Because of its ubiquity, when it comes to Futura, no single brand or public figure or product category overshadows all the countless others who have used it. It belongs simultaneously to everybody and to nobody. Very few fonts have that characteristic. Helvetica, for as neutral as it might seem, reeks of corporate branding circa 1980 to 2000. American Airlines, Target, Jeep, American Apparel, for example. Gotham, another geometric sans serif after Barack Obama's 2008 campaign, has become intrinsically linked with politicians and government branding worldwide. Bottle Rocket was fairly conventional in its visual storytelling, and Rushmore saw Anderson's style shift. But Tenenbaums really was when we saw the full realization of his retro-modernist style. Critics of Wes Anderson often complain that his movies feel constructed and artificial. His fans would actually probably agree, they just wouldn't see it as a bad thing. Futura is really perfectly typecast for this retro-modernism. What other typeface could straddle so many of the eclectic influences that Wes Anderson draws from? The conspicuous use of Futura through this movie, along with other aspects of the heightened visual stylization, draw attention to the fact that the story we are watching takes place in a world that doesn't follow the rules of our own. Despite the architectural hints, this is not the New York City that we know from reality, but a very specific view and interpretation of it. Where Rushmore used the framework of a play with curtains parting to open each act, Tenenbaums uses a book divided by chapters. We also see several books about or authored by various characters throughout the film. And this is where typography is used very well to evoke a specific time period. We have several instances of Helvetica from the 80s onwards, as well as the ultra 70s Milano for the cover of Etheline's book, Family of Geniuses, in the prologue. The literary theme is even used for the promotional materials, with the film poster in most regions using a book cover as the frame for the cast and title, which of course is set in Futura. Overall, the percentage of runtime which features Futura in some form or another is about a quarter, which means that in a movie like this one with an ensemble cast, Futura actually has more screen time than any of the lead actors. My favorite appearance has to be this cameo from Futura Display, another less ubiquitous typeface by Paul Renner, quite unrelated to the main Futura family, but designed to be complimentary. I only wish it had been carried by Owen Wilson's character, which would have been fitting given that relationship. This film may have been the peak of Wes Anderson's love affair with Futura, but it certainly wasn't the end of it. I'd like to welcome you to join me for future installments in this series when we'll look at how his typographic tastes evolved as his career progressed. If you've enjoyed this video, then stick around for more videos about all things type, logos, and design. As always, my name is Linus. Thank you kindly for watching, and I hope I'll catch you in another video.